afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Lost Begotten channel, where we're doing the fish tank stuff. Because, the, 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 really? Yeah, because it's not afternoon. You better be loud. Yeah, because it's not afternoon, sweetheart. <laughs> I love you. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah, because that really matters. It's 7 o'clock. I mean, it's the evening. Okay. I love you. Yeah, can't start that over now. So I'm going to go get a cigarette and try to collect my thoughts. Then I'll do the introduction. Then we can start the video. Okay. A script here. here. I don't have a. I don't have a prompter. I can't just pick up where I left off. Okay. okay. So. so. Today, okay. this evening, this evening, right? Is that is that okay with you, dear? This evening. <laughs> this evening, we brought home um, a fish who was from Macna. Um, and I, and I, I'm pretty sure I saw this little guy because I had remembered seeing one that had like the black cheeks and, and like the black over his eye. Like this is a cool looking fish. Okay. And, um, it doesn't matter, dear. Nobody's watching anyways. Um, <laughs> I was laughing at mine. She picked a piece of colorpa and was swimming around behind you with it in her mouth. That one floating around right behind you. It was in her mouth and she was just swimming behind you. And then she like looked at you and spat all right. it out. <laughs> <laughs> Why'd you put all that shit in here? Okay. Hold on. Let me get the camera up. Um, anyway. Just one distraction after that. So anyway, so this, this little guy came from Macna. And the uh, local Louisiana fish store, um, he had just bought a bigger space or rented out a bigger space for their store, and he goes and clears four tables out at the end of uh, at the end of Sunday uh, at Magna. But um, he got a few from Sustainable Aquatics, and then he got like almost all the fish from this one place that I can't freaking remember the name that he said. I'll have to email him a text message and ask him. Um, but I remember, I remember seeing this little guy, and I, I know what booth it was. I, I remember when I was there. You sure it wasn't the guy I was talking to you when Dusty came and found you? Was, yeah, yeah, no, that that was it. It was right there. Okay, so it's that, not called Aquatic Specialties. No, That's the store not, in Louisiana. It, it was they, they they didn't even sell fish. It was they were like they they had some kind of like product. Sold, but it wasn't fish. Yeah. Then it wasn't the guy I was talking to. It's from a breeder. Um. So, anyways, this guy probably came from the uh, from the sustainable aquatics display. Those ones that were sitting there in those little canisters that I showed you, how they plugged unplugged out. Yeah. I think that's where I saw him. Okay. And. So I, I, I deliver so I ten fish to this to, to the Louisiana fish store. Kind of a and, congratulations uh, on your new space. Can I just finish a train of thought once? Just just one train of thought, just like a mini train, just like fucking engine and caboose. That's all. <laughs> like really. I just, I, I, I can't. I can't do this. Deliver ten fish. Okay. Okay. We delivered, we delivered ten, ten fish, fish up, up there, there, and I'm like, like looking. He, he goes, "Hey, you want to see some clownfish?" He takes me on back to where he had just cleaned out, just apparently two uh, two displays worth of clownfish, and um, he let me net them myself, and the. Uh, the three Onyx Picassos that were back there, I wound up netting all three of them. So then I got a nice close look and I picked from these three. I mean, all three of them were just the most gorgeous little perculars you've ever seen. And I got this guy because the black striping goes all the way to the front of his face. And he's got 
premium Picasso marker. It was a choice between him and a guy with like a little helmet splotch, a white splotch on his face. And I just, uh, I don't know. I, I like I like this guy better. So, without further ado, we're gonna do open credits or whatever I do with the music and the pudding pops. Welcome to the Lost Begotten Channel, everybody. Stay tuned. yesterday good whatever the hell it is wherever the hell you are and welcome back to the lost begotten channel where we are live streaming new little baby clownfish well one new little baby clownfish and I think his name is going to be Yumichika yes exactly wow chica wow wow welcome to fish porn Really? No, no. My, uh, whoever is on shift duty in St. Petersburg right now, in the little troll factory, they decided to crack a joke. I appreciate that. Yes, it's fish porn. Spasibo. Uh, Dobra, enjoy. I mean, really, what else do you call it? I, I, you know, what? Well spoken, sir. Well spoken. Fish porn. It kind of is. I mean, we're wanting them to hook up and have eggs. It's more like, it's more like, uh, uh, what do you call it? Fish bachelorette, actually. Yeah, it really is. Because she's she's the female. Okay, the big one is the female, and the little one is the male could be still a juvenile might not even have uh what 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 really might not even have uh gonads yet probably has some strife already but not so much on the gonads gonads and the strife gonads and the strife gonads and the strife gonads and the lightning okay. I'm, I'm okay I'm calm. Everything's fine. Yes, yes, yes. this is basically uh, the introductions, the foreplay. It will be uh, 
probably at least a couple of months before they actually spawn. My spawning pair are these uh, trupercules right here. And that's where all the babies I've had came from. And here I have a, uh, a maroon acellaris hybrid with a black and regular acellaris hybrid. Not a mocha. He's not brown. He's got like a solid black stripe across the middle. But um, he's a good looking little fish. And I'm hoping they will bond soon. I need to maybe rearrange their uh, living arrangements. Because uh, I think she wants to spawn in a very tight space. I've had trouble arranging one in there. So I might wind up moving her to another tank. Or uh, possibly even swapping Bubbles and Zoom with my and Gaius. Yeah, Gaius. So the name for the new Picasso is going to be Yumichika because he's so damn pretty. And Tatsuki's the big lesbian, so that's, you know, bleach names. Tatsuki, Yumichika, the, the little pretty boy, and the big dyke. <laughs> so. Although, you know, she's hot for a dyke. You know, what, what can you say? And Tatsuki, look at her. Tatsuki's hot. Tatsuki's a hot clownfish. Oh, yes, yeah, sexy. <laughs> uh, I'm doing this just to make my wife make faces at me from across the room right now. Which um, yeah, is entertaining me. Ooh, look, I have a star on my forehead. Does that mean I'm special? There's a little star from, what is it, from the favorites thing on the browser? And it's just right on the middle of my forehead. I'm like a little, uh, I look like a little gay Charlie Manson. Anyways. <laughs> Oh, yes, we don't hold back any jokes here. Anything funny is worth fucking saying, as far as I'm concerned. Um, no, the the bigger one is the female. That's the one that's dominant. And as you can see, it's the same in this one. This is the female. The little, This little guy's the male. That one's the female. The little guy behind her is the male. Although Bubbles and Zoom are almost the same size, usually uh, it's best to, yeah, sorry about that, I got, it's the two camera thing. Um, I'm going to in a second there. Um, what was I going to say? Usually it's best to uh, pair up disparatous sizes so that dominance is clearly established. Um, these two came as a wild-caught mated pair. Um, they could have come from ORA, but I don't really think so. Just the, the, the regularity of their striping really makes them seem wild-caught to me. I've, I've gone back and forth, but now I'm in the wild-caught tank, uh, yeah, tank, I guess. Um, but they... You know, they were ready to spawn, but they still, every time I move them, they fight. And it's it's mostly just bubbles. Hmm. Well, it is a fish, so it does smell like fish, naturally. Um, yeah, you don't want to know what that one was, dear. Uh, hmm, now you done distracted me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, anyway, Bubbles, the uh, the female right here, the true pergula female that I've been having raising fish from. She's a uh, she's a bit rough with her mate. She has taken him and put his whole pectoral fin in her mouth and kind of like brought him all the way down and, and like body slammed him on the sand and I was like kind of worried for a second there but it just uh, 
you know, it turned out to be just kind of the way they are. <laughs> and they're a kinky couple. So, <laughs> so now we have this pair is a whole lot dis disparatus as far as size goes because that's a regular Acelerus. Um, he's actually about the size of, of like in between their two sizes. But this fish right here, this is mine. She's half a Acelerus, half maroon, and she's about two and a half years old now. And she is huge. She is, um, like, okay, I, I, I'm six foot three and change, and she does not fit that way on my hand. She is a, a big, massive, like, meaty, she made me muscular bleed. fish. She, she made my wife bleed once, bit the crap out of her. I'm going to try to zoom this in and kill the opaqueness. as good of a view as I can get for everybody. on is for her to go and dart at him like she's been doing and for him to go from holding his ground like that to dancing for her and you'll see him kind of twitch and swim a little bit sideways and upward and uh, that's the uh, submissive pre-courtship dance That doesn't mean they're courting. They're not courting until she dances back. Okay, so she'll elicit a response and then... Yep. Ornamentals usually don't grow very big. But as far as clownfish goes... My. Come on, my. Stop being a little chicken. Stop being a little chicken. Put your finger in the tank. <laughs> My is uh, my is massive. Like when when I show other people who keep clam fish, this this one right here. They uh, oh yes, saltwater fish are similar to birds in IQ and social habits. If they get depressed. If they get lonely. If they get obsessive. Yes. If you keep a clownfish by itself too long, it will bond with you, and then it will not accept mates. It's very much like a like a parrot. Thank you. 
Sir, we have a friend you left with you. Conversation going on over here. <laughs> do fish get depressed? Yes, they do. Do they get thirsty? No, he says he changes the water in their bowl every day. <laughs> Imagine we all come back as fish. That could be your grandfather there, the female nympho fish. It's usually younger souls that get born as fish, otherwise it's completely optional. Or my auntie. I don't know, I think I think of a few people that would be hilarious if they came back as fish. Oh, did you see the flame angel that Louisiana Fish Store yeah. had? Our size is already Ours is prettier than the color range. I have yet to see a flame angel that is as nicely colored as ours is. It's, it's, she's got a really good stomach. Come on, Yumi Chica, you gotta learn to dance if you're gonna make it in there with She costume. basically constantly gets gumbo to Toby Pons. Come on, my baby. Let's get in there. Other than tearing up your pillar plexus. Why don't you want three fruit chocolate bowls? You get better food. Come on. Come on. Show me that you have enough discipline. Come on. You're like stealing, baby. What the hell are you doing? Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit of reassurance so that they are not here to scream at someone. The guy is just doing some kind of weird little dancey thingy on the plate. Yeah, he's trying to show mine how cool he can teach it. He doesn't seem the least bit concerned.
Eating animals is fine as long as you offer. Remember to pray for the animal and <coughs> thanks to it. Pray for its spirit. Pray that if it moves on, it moves on to a better life. Pray that, it, that if it did not earn such things, that it should be wiser in its next life. Believe it or not, even fish and insects have nice ones and psychosadists. You can even find nice predators. But plants can apparently feel and see. At least the cow has the option of running away. A plant is just stuck there. <laughs> Plants can't see. Why does a tree give apples? Because it wants them. Because <laughs> it wants to make applesauce. It's proper to hunt, it's proper to fish, it's proper to eat meat, as long as you are spiritually aware and understand the purpose that you serve. If you don't understand the purpose that you serve, you even risk tainting your own soul by absorbing an unblessed and uncleansed spirit. Which is why you don't want to eat raw meat. You may even find that eating red meat, um, undercooked red meat, can increase the frequency of nightmares. Every cell contains memory. Every cell contains energy. Make our way to Calvary now. Push that part down. And the sand. She just tried to push it back down. That was funny. It's like, oops, shit. That didn't work out quite how you wanted to, huh, baby? <laughs> Tatsuki and Yumikicha. Yumichika. Yumichika. Tatsuki and Yumichika might be the prettiest little pair of clownfish I've ever seen. Like, I really don't like those clownfish that have too much white on them. You know? Air holders. Like, I, I could have gotten the one that had the uh, the white on its head. Those are actually more valuable retail-wise. But that guy just looked really healthy. 
for brood stock purposes. There's a difference between the fish you want to collect and the fish you want to use as brood stock. You want a combination of traits. The eye can get focused on trying to repeat that white head marking. And I could wind up breeding for five years and not get a single fish with a white head marking. So I'm better off just getting an overall good quality fish who's got really strong genes. And if the variations occur, the variations occur. I get to sell that one for $100 Feel free to keep commenting. I'll be over there in a minute. Everything used to be water, but I eventually got bored. Behemoth is the highest vibration. Um, technically, it's Leviathan. Um, but I see what you're saying. I think he got her there and was quick. Oh, she did. He, he nipped him. He nipped her back. Yeah, usually a female will actually want to see some feistiness in a male. So, I mean, he could submit and she would move on if he wasn't a little bit feisty. So, that could be interesting. Yeah, it looks like, looks like top, uh, Maya and Gaia are thinking about getting a little closer. She's been cleaning that pot lately. But um, like I said, I think it's going to take moving them to Leviathan 
is the state of achieving equality with Gabriel's chair. Um, and it has only been done by one being in history, and that's the Whore of Babylon. And that is the Nibiru anomaly that was headed towards the Earth until I rearranged reality. Back when the Earth was a ball. Which at this point, <sighs> kind of remains to be seen. Space or spiritual reality? Which one is the final frontier? Um, for the information or for saving the world? Either way, you're welcome. This channel's purpose is to save the world. All of my researches and my, my aquaculture collection and my soon-to-be marine fish business. All one big plan to save the world. Namely from you people. But uh, that's a whole different this channel teaches everyone else how to save the world. Namely, how to get everyone to get along. How to get all of the bullshit that crusts people's eyes from having their heads up their own asses for so long. Wash it away so that they can see with new eyes. But the fish tanks, let me tell you, man, keeping saltwater fish, that hobby, getting big, getting mainstream, people people getting just, you know, being like the number one thing you put on Instagram is your fucking fish tank, that right there is how to save the world. And I'm not talking about geopolitically, I'm talking about the physical chemistry that sustains life is in danger right now. We are in danger of world famine and plague simultaneous by 2050. If people do not start keeping fish, namely Republicans, why Republicans? One, because they can afford the nice fish tanks. And two, because it will make them understand global warming and environmentalism in general. It will make them understand how phosphate and nitrate runoffs from farms are literally killing this planet. And it's not, I'm not somebody who's saying you have to stop that. I'm in fact saying I can teach you how to do it more. I can teach you how to make this planet, current landmass, Antarctica not included, sustain 12 and a half billion people. The first step, everybody buy a fish tank and start learning what it does. So you can understand when people talk about pollution, what that really does. So you can understand that it's important that you had an 80% fucking reef bleaching event in the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. One of the wonders of the world has been decimated. And humans need to realize that they are not some high and mighty flawless creation that can do whatever it pleases. 
and should they persist on such foolish, arrogant, and destructive courses, they will be made low. But anyways, how about them saying? Oh, oh, creation versus evolution debate. Hmm. That would be fun for me. Come debate with me what I do. <laughs> Impeach that fucker yet? He visits Houston. Oh, he's going to visit Houston. That should be interesting. Houston does not like Donald Trump. And he chooses right now to do the DACA thing, it's like he's trying to cause riots. Houston, having probably the largest dreamer population across ethnic lines of any city in the country, Houston, that city that Yankees like Trump always fucking gloss over when listing the big cities in America. They always go New York, L.A., Chicago, Denver, Seattle, Pittsburgh, Atlanta. Nobody seems to realize that Houston has been, for a long fucking time, the fourth largest city in the country, and the largest landmass area city in the country. You can drive for 73 minutes on I-10, 10 over the speed limit, and you will still be in Houston. he's going to choose now. I mean, just understand he's a Satanist. Understand he's a fucking troll to his core. And what they do is essentially psychic vampirism. They get a kick out of sapping your souls by walking all over the legalities that you've set up to protect yourselves. By walking all over the laws that keep civilization together. By walking all over the laws that God and Christ gave you. And they do things that drive you crazy. And they stand on that map of broken laws. And they backwards channel the energy of your aggravated soul. As you wonder, why can't I do anything about this injustice? Unite. Resist. You have no choice but enslavement. It is just as it was 2,000 years ago. And this horde comes every century. That's why they call their commanders centurions. It is a mafia that stretches from Ulaanbaatar to Sicily. And it always has. This is not new. 
This is for God. You were made to forget this. But it's right in front of you. It's perfectly obvious. It's what happens when people suffer from demonic blindness. They cannot see what instinct should register as self-preservation. The fact that the horde was never defeated, never driven back. You saw a bunch of people break a wall down in 1990, 89 or whatever. That was November 9th, by the way, 11-9, 1989. That date has been used for conquest after conquest. And it marks a battle in which the Horde captured a certain princess. It was a great victory for them. Anyway, this isn't supposed to be one of those story videos. I'm going to shut the fuck up. Not the tease in. But, just to sum up if you're wondering, every thousand years, The Horde renews its effort by trying to basically kidnap Mother Nature because she comes with the Incarnation of Christ to teach everyone and they know both the timing and the necessary provocation of the arrival, of the return. And what they want her for is a breeding program. They want to use her DNA to make the next Nephilim Hosts. Gero Umbas. Imitation first ones. Outcast. So anyway, understanding the Horde and understanding its demonic nature is the path to forgiveness for everyone. 
even those who are possessed and enslaved at the highest level, who have become the, uh, the mafia, and who accuse any, any decent group of political people of being the Illuminati for uh, having fun, basically. The Illuminati has always been and will always be one with the whole. They represent Catholic anti Christianity. And it all ties back to. Kazan, Kazakhstan, and Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. The green cube of RT and the black cube of Mecca. All ties back to Ulaanbaatar. It's basically, if, if you've ever seen Babylon 5, the sci-fi series? Think of Ulan Bator like Zahadun. <laughs> Which is why I know that if I go to Ulan Bator, I will die. <laughs> Perhaps if I was a little more impressed with humans, might be worth it. But as long as humans behave in such a way that I need to reserve backup plans, i.e. starting over, that that battle which will have to take place in this plane and the next and can only be won if I die, and the battle itself will take place after I die. Um, you know, that, that's kind of a last resort, you know? I spent 420 years trapped inside of a tree. Then I spent... 30 years looking for my wife and you know we, we've been married for a couple years now and not not looking to uh, not looking to mess that up you know call me uh, call me selfish if you want but you know am I allowed to have a life too People act like I'm not allowed to have free will or a personality, for Christ's sake. Where'd you get that idea? Oh yeah, after the Johannite genocide, when you lost all knowledge of John and Mary and their family, um, even though you wound up with these people called royalty, and they were all our descendants, you somehow forgot all that too. It's been right in front of you this whole time, but nobody could see it. Because of demonic blindness. Just like nobody could see that the Taliban was funded by Russia. The CIA? Oh, no. The CIA got rid of Russia. From Afghanistan. And they set up a little, a little provisional government that was supposed to hold elections. They held elections like three weeks later and they had the little government trying to put itself together and then three months after that the Taliban came rolling in that's when the Taliban took over what they came rolling in on Russian tanks 
So the back, the CIA backed government in Afghanistan lasted three months. Since then, since 80 fucking seven, 87, I think it's been the Taliban backed by Russia. And you know, I, that was that was confirmed by a freaking U.S. general, and it's in addition to all the proof that I've laid out. I have laid out absolute confirmation, beyond shadow of a doubt, that Russia basically deployed the Islamic State. And if you the fur the further you trace it back, the the more you realize Russia and Al Qaeda were one. It was the next strategy. It's why they let the Cold War end. But Brezhnev, former Soviet Premier Brezhnev, wrote a book about it that got published in 1978. Demonic blindness. People focus on what they want. You can sell your soul little by little. Yes, you can. I like the new neighbors. I got the house all to myself right now. So I can get on a quality rant. <laughs> Even though I can't see the screen. So for all I know, everybody just like got sick of hearing me talk and left. Because I wasn't talking about clownfish porn anymore. Anybody who's been slightly spiritually awakened should know about the relationship between the Hamid incarnation and such names as Poseidon and Neptune. Because in that relative story, You find reference to the twelve tribes and even Joseph. Joseph was an incarnate Christ. But to give you an idea of how diluted those stories can be, Elijah and Elisha were male and female. And, um, boy, that's a bit of a soap opera. anyways is this a simulation with a built-in escape um, unfortunately not really for anyone but me um, only that which can self-create can survive without creation. As far as Flat Earth, you need to look at the 2011 videos. 2011 is when it became flat. Up until then it was swaying towards the round 
as the result of a lack of spiritual awareness across the entire planet and essentially what amounts to a manifestoral vote, which I've explained also on this channel. Um, but you can see the actual exorcism of the sun, um, which includes the point at which the earth changed from round to flat, which basically appears as a glitch on the video. It goes black and then I'm doing the same thing I was doing previously. That's not editing, that's a time dilation glitch that got caught on camera. There were some things that were, I would say, more interesting than that that didn't get caught on camera because the, the psychoactive energy was too intense and the camera kept on freezing. It was a, it was a pocket PC from, you know, like I, I got it in 2005. It was, it was a pretty old phone. Um, 2004. Yeah, so... It didn't, it didn't give the best of results, but I got a few very interesting things from back then on the video, just for posterity's sake, and, um, you know, to make sure I wasn't crazy, because I'm a very rational, skeptical person, and, um, you know, I, I think everything spiritual should be approached on the presumption of insanity until otherwise proven rational okay so that should give you an idea of how far we've come on this channel anyways flat earth is the result of the means by which i saved all of us from the Leviathan of Hathor, the Whore of Babylon. And if you go back just a couple of videos, you can see, um, like, well, I, was, I doubt she'll show up, but the Leviathan is trapped in an alternate dimension that I keep here. I keep another dimension right here um, for communion with spirits from previous realities. But, um, and I've, I've, sh I've shown photos of the faces and different symbols that come up in this one. There's actually some arcane symbols used to seal in her energy. And in this one, in the photos, you can see faces that are kind of creepy looking. I mean, they just keep changing and just get creepier and creepier. I like to constantly make fun of myself, too, so that's, that's something you got to keep an eye out for. Um... But essentially, right now, we are in the expanse of consciousness. So this is a manifesto reality that um, responds akin to programming code as it is discovered, according to quantum expectation theory. Okay? Um, now... Alice in Wonderland, that's between you and your ancestors. Okay, and what I mean by that is some people do not have an Alice in Wonderland-like experience, and at this point, pretty much everybody's here, except for those who have recently departed. Um, but it's a, very, it's a very full house at this, at this point. Um, Alice in Wonderland and those types of experiences not only are they muse and tell various stories of Mother Nature and myself but they give reference to dimensions in which lessons are taught to souls and for no other purpose do these dimensions exist like the Billy Goat's Gruff one is the one that I remember the the clearest from my childhood this lifetime around. The grass is greener on the other side. Don't get caught by trolls in the fridge. Um, Dingo, come on, man. Stop chewing your balls right there. Really? <sighs> my dog's old. He, uh, he doesn't listen at all anymore. The hell would I say? I'm looking at my reef tank. I guess I can show you my reef tank. 
right about there. That's the top tank. The webcam is streaming down there in the sump section of the lower tank. It's just a lower tank. <laughs> it's not it's not really a sump. I've got a bunch of different types of macroalgae in there, but I I have a tub that things run with it runs from the top tank to the tub for the bottom tank. And the tub actually has a protein skimmer and a gigantic piece of live rock in it. Um, so the dodo, you mean like the inbred condor? Condors are, 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 are a formerly spiritual being. I'd, I'd love to actually meet one in this life and see if I could communicate with it. Um, but a condor used to be a very spiritual being. Um, and the dodo is uh, a lesser bred condor, if I'm not mistaken. Or was. <laughs> the dodo was a lesser bred condor. But um, magnificent family of birds. Um, what else do you want to know about them? <laughs> Who is Jacques? Um, Jacques de Mole? That would be my life, last lifetime as a general. In which I used to like to ride around and chop off heads. <laughs> uh, the dodo never existed. I tend to agree with that statement. It just looks like a fucking condor to me. Uh -huh. But, um... Unless you're referring to some sort of Mandela effect type scenario. But, um, to me, a dodo is just a family of condors. And, and there's, there's other condors that look like them. It wouldn't be hard to breed that back into existence, really. Um... Giant trees. Um, hmm. I used to be one. They cut me down. About 1838, I would estimate. Judging from what I said, I was I was very happily asleep as a tree. You understand? But. At the point at which it was cut down is when I re started to resume having a human-shaped soul, if you will. But I could not move my eyes. I could not breathe. I could not change my focus. I just sat there on this chopped-down tree stump. And it was... It was... It was... It wasn't, sh it wasn't flat. It was, it was all angled and uncomfortable and awkward. It was, it was at an angle like facing me you, you just be kind of lean back into the side back and to the left twice in a row a few days oh that dodo huh. Well, I never, never, never know a thing about the weather, but the weather never, never does a thing for me. Well, let's sail, let's sail, let's sail, wind seas can lay up, 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 and a bottle of tea. But I never, never, never do a thing about the weather, because the weather never, never does a thing for me. I know nothing of the dodo. What dodo? First thing I thought of when you said the dodo was that channel that does all the pet rescue stuff. I'm like, oh, the dodo. <laughs> oh. I'm starting to see this spirit that's been fucking with you. You've been... You've been pressured by an anomaly, have you? That one's name is Complacency. 
if you'd like to see a very good rendition of him, watch Dark Crystal and look for the character Chamberlain. Yes, please. Kind of like the Chamberlain who wanted to appease Hitler. Complacency. That's the dodo. Your question has been answered. Face the psychological aspect of complacency and that demon will have no power over you. Or, more appropriately said, you will realize that that demon has no power over you. For you are a child of God. Why are you way over there? Give me Chica. Back up the camera so I can see. There we go. Annual focus on the webcam. Um, your statements are very interesting, but the wise would tell you that it's always best to remember what I said before you adhere to what you heard before. Now your path is linear. You've learned what you've learned before now so that you can hear my words and then put together all of the information and become a witness yourself. That's how people collect what they are here to teach. Well, so I've been gone since 1561, um, so I can't say whether um, your 419 number, if, if, if you're not just throwing a number out there, I can't say whether or not that, that is accurate. When I returned to consciousness, in this state, okay, in, in a linear state, not an omnipresent state, okay, that was during the beginning of the pre-industrial revolution, and that, to my knowledge, the, the tree culling, the mass tree culling, was in full swing at that point. Um, it might have started then that makes let's see if I can remember anything that isn't doubling up with a movie <laughs> I'd be a lot better off if I had never watched TV in this life but you know Ah. 
last tree culling I remember was in North Asia. Um, and that was about 1500 years ago. And that was uh, the last dragon war. That ended in the wrong kind of peace. <laughs> but, um, those might be the trees of significance that you're referring to that certainly weren't around anymore by my last lifetime. Um, but they were around in 880. But postscript, everything could be off by 200 years. So that kind of puts a little layer of confusion on everything. Because I don't know whether it's 200 years since 1500 or 200 years since 2000 years ago. So 2000 years ago could be 2200 years ago. I mean, um, but that's just a matter of records discrepancy that I find very confusing. And, um, you know, you, you, to a certain extent, um, excellence in education just makes one's brainwashing worse. And, you know, I did good in school. <laughs> I don't know you. Um, not powerful enough to know which demon the dodo was. So, I would be trying to consult the halls of your ancestors. Which, by the way, apparently, um, your demon is apparently powerful enough to have caused me to forget what I was saying in a lesson that you apparently need to hear. Um, ooh, and there it goes again. Halls of your ancestors. So, the stars. Okay. Your dream state, your Alice in Wonderland journey, is for your soul to learn enough lessons to have accomplished overcoming enough demons, like complacency. Complacency being the number one way that all other demons wind up ruining a person. Complacency. It's like the underrated demon. Seriously. Um, but your objective is to survive determination of your physical form. At what point, at which point you become an orb. Or, in fully ascended terms, that is, once you have completed all of the journeys which your original self set out for back when you were one with God, okay, then you become truly God's child and become a star. Or, and this is also um, inclusive of intermediary stages in a way, as an orb, you can visit the halls of your ancestors, which are the stars of the ascended beings that came before you. Um, and, you know, look up. There they are. So, yeah, that's what you really wanted to know. From me. Ooh, fish.
Everybody's gonna play, 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 play. Everybody's gonna hate, 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 hate. I'm gonna shake, 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 shake. Shake it off, shake it off, shake it off. Ah. <laughs> I want to meet Taylor Swift so I can ask her if she wants to invest in my aquaculture business. officials and others briefed on the matter. The letter was reportedly drafted while the president was on a long weekend at his golf club in New Jersey. It was never sent, but it was apparently saved, and now Robert Mueller has a copy. When James Comey was fired a few days later, the White House had an official line on why they said the president made the decision based on Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein's recommendation. Rosenstein, you'll recall, was Comey's boss and the man running the Russia investigation because Attorney General Jeff Sessions recused himself. The White House based the letter the president actually sent to Comey on Rosenstein's memo. But the New York Times reports they made one significant revision, adding a point that was personally important to Mr. Trump. And that was a line in the middle of the four-paragraph letter that the president sent to let Comey know why he was being canned. Quote, while I greatly appreciate you informing me on three separate occasions that I am not under investigation, I nevertheless concur with the Department of the, with the judgment of the Department of Justice that you are not able to effectively leave the bureau. It's a point that's been important to the president. He stressed it again the next week. In an interview with NBC's Lester Holt. We had a very nice dinner, and at that time he told me you were not under investigation, no. which I knew anyway. No. I didn't get a phone call, he said it. I didn't want to have a phone call, he said it. So he said it once at dinner, and then he said it twice during phone calls. Did, did you call him? Uh, I, one case I called him, and one case he called him. And did you ask him I under investigation? I actually asked him, yes. I said, if it's possible, would you let me know? Am I under investigation? He said, you are not under investigation. Now, while we do not know exactly what was in this draft letter, new reporting from the Wall Street Journal gives us an idea. They write, paraphrasing the letter, an administration official said, Mr. Trump wanted this message sent. It told me three times I'm not under investigation, but you won't tell the world, and it's hampering the country. So why was Trump so upset with Comey in that moment, that weekend in May? Several reports indicate it was something Comey said just a few days before while he testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee about the Clinton email investigation. Look, this is terrible. It makes me mildly nauseous to think that we might have had some impact on the election. But honestly, it wouldn't change the decision. Political reports, once Trump returned from that trip to New Jersey, it was clear he was not changing his mind. Then the White House began frantically searching for how to explain the firing. Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders was asked about the draft letter in the briefing room today. First of all, can you confirm the existence of that letter? And secondly, can uh, that letter be made uh, public? And thirdly, a new report to John McGahn thought it was inappropriate. Can you discuss whether or not the meeting with the President should have been the draft explanation was appropriate at that time? Uh, I'm not going to get into any of that. I think we covered um, a lot of those things during that time. As Ty Cobb said earlier today, to the extent the special prosecutor is interested in these matters, we will be fully transparent with his investigation. We frankly don't have anything to add beyond that. And with that, we bring in our lead-off panel, former U.S. Attorney Joyce Vance, who spent 25 years as a federal prosecutor, former Chief of Staff to Vice President Biden and Gore, and former Counsel to Al Gore in the 2000 recount, Ron Klain, National Political Reporter for Axios, Jonathan Swan, and Boston Globe columnist and journalism ethics chair at Pointer, Indira Lachman. Welcome to all of you. Uh, let me start with you, 
Jonathan. Take us back to that weekend in May. It was a rainy weekend at Bedminster uh, at the golf club. But there were other plans for that weekend. What ended up happening? Uh, the president was supposed to play golf with uh, the Australian golfer Greg Norman. Uh, he went down by helicopter on Thursday. Uh, he was, it was a rare weekend where he did not have his chief of staff, Bryce Priebus, or his chief strategist, Steve Bannon, with him. It was just Donald Trump, Jared Ivanka, and Stephen Miller. Uh, rainy weekend, he was stewing indoors over the weekend, uh, venting about Kobe. And now we learn that he uh, worked with Stephen Miller on what has been described uh, variously as a screed or a rant, uh, justifying his decision to fire James Comey. Joyce, let me uh, let's talk a little bit about what this, what happened in this letter that Don McGahn, the White House counsel, ended up seeing and uh, reportedly thought was problematic. What stands out to you about this? Well, the devil will be in the details with the letter. We don't know the precise language in the letter. It's sort of interesting that we have these reports, but we have only characterization. If the letter was limited to President Trump having a, a great difficulty with Director Comey because he wouldn't reveal publicly what he had assured Trump about privately, the fact that he wasn't under investigation, then we have a situation that's a little bit more difficult to convey knowledge to the participants. But if this letter comes out and says, you know, the, tr the Russia investigation is a, a made-up sort of a bollock that needs to be ended, you aren't ended, so I'm firing you, then really everyone who touched the letter, who saw the letter, mm -hmm. has a real problem. And there's uh, another piece of complexity to this, Ron Clayton. Uh, the New York Times had uh, something else that was interesting that I want to highlight here. It said, during the May 8th Oval Office meeting with Mr. Trump, Mr. Rosenstein was given a copy of the original letter and agreed to write a separate memo for Mr. Trump about why Mr. Comey should be... What about the meetings between Trump and Mr. Silverstein? Now, this becomes hard to start connecting the dots, but on the face of it, this seems very unusual. Rod Rosenstein, James Comey's boss, head of the Russia investigation for all intents and purposes, because the attorney general has stepped aside, sees this screed or this letter, whatever it is, and then takes it and says, I'm going to do something with this. Yeah, I mean, I think it really calls into question what Rod Rosenstein was doing here. He uh, saw the letter, new letter, written, drafted uh, a different letter. Uh, the administration put out and said, this is why we're firing uh, James Colby. The governor says, based on this recommendation of firing James Colby, that's just a lie. We now know it's a lie. We know he had made the decision to fire Director Colby uh, in, in that golf weekend in Bedminster. He then drafted some kind of crazy explanation for it. Rod Rosenstein knew it. So the question really is, was Rod Rosenstein just providing political cover for President Trump? And how does that uh, affect his role in this investigation? on an ongoing basis. Because in era subsequent to that, we heard from uh, a number of people, from the president himself, from Sarah Huckabee Sanders, that this was largely done on the advice and counsel of uh, Ron Rosenstein. But it does give you a sense, uh, at least it gets you into the president's head a little bit about this idea that he was obsessed with James Comey telling the country that he was not under investigation. What does this make you think? Right. I mean, it's not just Ron Rosenstein who we have to be wondering about his rationale, but also Stephen Miller, the aide who, if this, these reports are correct, um, might also potentially be caught up in a potential obstruction of justice investigation. Because let's face it, there's the ever-changing rationale given by the president and his team about why James Comey was fired. The first rationale given is it's because he mishandled Hillary Clinton's email investigation. Then the second rationale given is, no, it's because he lost the confidence of the FBI rank and file. The third rationale given is, remember when he, when Donald Trump was in the Oval Office with the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov and the Russian ambassador, and he said to them, oh, that James Comey, he was a nut job. I had to get rid of him, now I'm going to have a freer hand. Then the fourth rationale was the public letter from Rod Rosenstein. And the fifth rationale was Lester Holt, telling Lester Holt, well, I had to get rid of him because of that Russia thing. So, you know, it's an ever-changing, constantly moving target. Um, I think it definitely I, I think Mueller's team is investigating it, um, but I think that there are numerous aides at this point who we have to wonder what were they thinking, and the fact that Don McGahn, the White House counsel, the counsel was feeling
feeling very uncomfortable with this. Um, in the end, the president put back in the very things that the White House counsel wanted taken out, like the references to I'm not under investigation, and the references, you know, the personal references were put right back in there. Hey, Nora, we're about 10 minutes into the show, and I think you win panelists of the night just for being able to recite those five uh, <laughs> rationales. That's pretty amazing. Uh, Joyce, this does put Rod Rosenstein into a different light for many people. Now, again, this is, this is reporting. We don't have confirmations. We don't know what else Rod Rosenstein uh, had to say about any of this. But if the idea as presented is that the president had uh, written out this letter with Stephen Miller, Rod Rosenstein takes it away and returns with a, a, a different memo, which gives the president some cover to get rid of, uh, of James Comey. Uh, this has got to give some people some pause about the fact that Ron Rosenstein is the guy in charge of, uh, of anything to do with Russia at the Department of Justice. Well, we have a little more detail here. We know that Rosenstein pushed back when the president tried to hang the firing of Jim Comey on him. He vehemently objected to that. The letter that he wrote, the memo that he wrote to the president, didn't actually uh, take, reach the conclusion that Comey should be fired. He talked about actions he had take, taken. He disagreed with the way Comey had conducted the public part of the Clinton email investigation. But Rosenstein never called for the firing. So I think we then have the next step that occurs here when there's an outcry from the White House. Uh, they don't want to see a special counsel come on board. It's Rosenstein who makes the decision since Attorney General Sessions has recused to put a special counsel in place. And he doesn't hire just any special counsel. He brings back Bob Mueller, this storied, legendary FBI director. So if I was a betting person, which I typically try not to be in investigative matters, I would say that there's another story here. There's some pieces of the puzzle about Ron Rosenstein's involvement that we haven't heard yet. Uh, I was saying to Ron Klain, uh, Jonathan Swann, in, in the break, that uh, for what I've given to just be five years hence, looking back and saying, here's what you guys didn't know about this. Uh, but, but, but Jonathan, um, this has been a difficult week for the White House with respect to nightly revelations about Russia. Uh, while most of us have been uh, watching that, uh, the developments of Hurricane Harvey and uh, its aftermath in, in Texas, uh, this Russia stuff has been trickling out. What does this do to a White House, especially a White House that has a very busy September ahead? Well, they already had uh, very damaged credibility um, with regards to Russia uh, and their shifting explanations for the COVID firing. And whatever remains of that credibility has just been shredded with these stories today. Uh, and people inside know that. They know that. I mean, like, it is a damning chronology. You, you have a president of the United States sitting at home in his golf club with his son-in-law and daughter and uh, a 31-year-old aide drafting this letter, presenting it to his team, including the vice president, on the Monday. And then they all come out with this phony line about they were acting on Rosenstein's recommendation. This chronology has just been completely blown up. I mean, Trump, frankly, had already blown it up with his interview with Lester Holt and other things he'd said. But the fact that Pence was in the room in the Oval, that is what we call a bad fact. And I don't know about the legality of this or where this investigation is shifting, and no one does, because it actually has been kept very quiet. But we can see certain things. We can see who Mueller's hiring, the, the caliber of investigators that he's hiring. And we can now see that uh, the White House is on the back foot. The, the credibility has been shot. Uh, and there, let's talk about uh, it's an unduly busy September because we have a, a budget resolution that has to occur. Otherwise, the government shuts down. We have uh, the aftermath of Harvey, which is going to be expensive. We have a president who, until Harvey hit, was talking about uh, allowing the government to shut down so that he can get funding for his uh, budget wall. And that's just urgent stuff that has to get done. The president has started touring around the country discussing tax reform, which there isn't any meat on those bones either. Uh, tell me how you see the, the next few weeks proceeding. Um, I think it's going to be difficult for the president because he's got his list of things, his want-to-dos and his must-dos. And, you know, for the president, those a lot of those are personal. It's about fulfilling not just the agenda for the American people, but the agenda that he wants for Donald Trump. And that, of course, means his base and the wall. And he has, of course, threatened to shut down the government over the wall. Don't forget that he said that uh, Mexico was going to pay for it, but now it seems the American people are supposed to pay for it. I think that Donald Trump is not
not going to be able to tie hurricane spending to the wall. I think that Congress feels that uh, I don't think the ship is going to sail that way. We now know that the president is, has requested over $7 billion in hurricane relief funds. I think that's going to go through probably, um, but I don't think he's going to be able to tie the wall to it. Tax reform, that's a whole other conversation. How much time have you got, Allie? <laughs> uh, you know, it's a topic I love, and there we can talk about this a lot, Ron. Uh, let's, let's talk a little about the fact that, you know, the, the Russia stuff's been trickling out for a long time. It hasn't, uh, it hasn't caused Congress to break with the president on its own. The president has gone out of his way in the last month to, to break down Congress, and then the Charlottesville stuff happened. Now we've got uh, talk by members of Congress that, in a lot of ways, they're going to need to go it alone on a number of issues, even the, the, the issue of DACA, which we'll be talking about later in the show. A lot of members of Congress are saying, we have work to do. We're going to get it done with or without the president. Well, first of all, I think on Russia, there's a lot of smoke here, and it's not just documents being burned at the Russian consulate in San Francisco. You know, the, the, the pile keeps getting higher and higher and higher, and at some point, the uh, Republicans on the Hill won't just be able to peer over and ignore it. But I agree, the other problem he has is a fundamentally broken relationship with the Russian, with the, with the Republicans in Congress. He's at war with Mitch McConnell. He's an occasional war on and off with Paul Ryan. Uh, John McCain was the senior most Republicans in the Senate, published an op-ed this week, basically calling the president reckless and unreliable. And that's not the basis. He's got a huge September ahead, DACA potentially in Congress, debt, uh, details on the, on the spending bill, disastrously four big D's to deal with in September, and a broken relationship with Republican leadership. And you just teased something very interesting that we're going to talk about very shortly. Uh, Ron Klain, uh, Joyce Vance, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, the rest of you, stick around before uh, a moment. Uh, we're going to continue with this. Plus, uh, Ron just alluded to black smoke that we saw coming out of the Russian consulate in San Francisco. We're going to talk about that when we come back. Plus, John McCain takes the op-ed page. Ron just talked about that, too, to quote the president. Uh, the fake news watch a vote with some blistering words for his colleagues on the Hill and for President. Welcome back to the 11th hour in San Francisco today. Black smoke poured out of a building, but firefighters were turned away. An Associated Press reporter heard people come out and tell them nothing was wrong. It was coming from a fireplace, a fire in the fireplace. Notably, the temperature in San Francisco hit an all-time high today of 106 degrees. What a day for a fire. Uh, and the building? It's the Russian consulate. Ordered to close within 48 hours by the U.S. State Department yesterday. That move in retaliation for Putin's July decision to reduce personnel from the U.S. mission in Russia. Our panel is back with us. I've got uh, Jonathan Swan, uh, Indira Lachmanat, and Ron Clay. Thanks to the three of you for, uh, for sticking around. Uh, Ron, let me start with you. There was a headline uh, from the New York Times today. Glenn Fresh and Maggie Haberman uh, paced, uh, had a, a great story saying, uh, Forceful Chief of Staff grates on Trump. And the feeling is mutual. Here's what it says. While Mr. Kelly has quickly brought some order to a disorganized and demoralized staff, he's fully aware of the president's volcanic resentment about being managed, and he has tread gingerly through the minefield of Mr. Trump's psyche. But the president has still bridled at what he perceives as being told what to do. Like every other new sheriff in town, Mr. Trump has hired to turn things around at the White House or in his presidential campaign. Mr. Kelly is, uh, has gradually diminished his appeal to his restless boss. What is different this time is that Mr. Trump, mired in self-destructive controversies and record low approval ratings, needs Mr. Kelly more than Mr. Kelly needs him. Unlike many of the men and women eager to work for Mr. Trump over the years, the new chief of staff signed on reluctantly, more out of a sense of duty than a need for affirmation, personal enrichment, or fame. Now, you and I had a conversation just as John Kelly was coming on to take the job. Uh, that would be the role he would have to play. I don't know that anybody thought he, of all people, was going to relish the role. And it sounds like he's having some difficulty with it. Well, look, the problem with the Trump presidency remains Donald Trump, first and foremost. And no matter what John Kelly does, it's not going to really change that. And indeed, the discipline that Kelly has imposed is relatively minor. He isn't trying to control Trump's Twitter. He isn't trying to control Trump's statements. He's just trying to control some of the information flow to the president. By the standards of the two White Houses I've worked in, this would be baby stuff. And the fact that Trump presents that tells us a lot about Trump. 
The fact that John Kelly, though, says he's not going to take it. In that piece in the New York Times, he says Trump talked to him all he's never talked to before. He's not going to take that again. And then earlier at the Arizona rally, Donald Trump tried to call him up on stage. John Kelly was there. He wouldn't come. That's a very different kind of Trump staffer. We're going to see how these cultures mesh at all, if at all. Yeah, and there are, uh, you know, one of the things that, that people say about this White House is that, okay, maybe John Kelly has what it takes to organize the White House, or as Ron says, the information flow to the president and impose some discipline with the staffing and the number of people who come into his office and how they call him and making appointments, all of these things that it seems he's being able to manage. But as Ron said, that's baby stuff. And, and given the agenda and the things that have to be done, the failure of the repeal of Obamacare and tax reform, does all of this matter? I said it before, you cannot clean house for somebody who doesn't want their house cleaned. The president thrives on chaos and disorder. That's the way he likes to run things. You know, we, we see the apprentice as the external manifestation of the way he likes to run his business empire. He likes to have rivals fighting, fighting for his attention, you know, his loyalty. This is just the way he likes to do things. And the fact that we learned from the reporting today that staffers who are annoyed by John Kelly's efforts to reign in the president are sort of derisively calling him behind his back church lady uh, tells you a lot that, you know, one person who's actually trying to impose some order is seen as annoying and ruining the party. I mean, if the president himself is, by all accounts, secretly using his cell phone to call Steve Bannon when John Kelly is trying to not allow those calls through, I think it kind of tells you what you need to know. Ultimately, the president is in charge, not the not the chief of staff, and the president will get to do what he wants to do. Jonathan, what's your take on this? It's inevitable that uh, what's already happening to some extent, that Trump is going to rebel against this new order around him. Uh, something uh, pretty interesting happened today. It, it might seem minor to a lot of people, but it's actually a big deal. Uh, Keith Schiller, who's Donald Trump's personal security guard, but really is like a brother to him, um, is leaving the White House. Uh, and that's a big deal. He is someone who has been with Trump for almost two decades. Trump confides in him, tells him everything. He's often the first person that the president sees in the morning, goes and uh, fetches him from the residence, walks him back to the residence late, late at night. He's a conduit to Donald Trump's old world back in New York, his old friends. He often feeds him information from uh, people on the outside. And uh, Trump asks him advice. What's the advice? He is one of the last few people from the, that old world uh, cut out. And frankly, Donald Trump, yes, he, the, everyone recognizes that the Oval Office needed order and that this couldn't continue. But I don't believe that Donald Trump is going to uh, sort of put up with this for much longer. I think he's going to lash out. I think he's going to call the old people. I mean, he still talks to Corey Lewandowski. I, I just don't see this as a sustainable uh, course of action. Jonathan Swan, thank you for that. Jonathan Swan, Rob McLean, uh, thanks to both of you in here. Stick around with me uh, for another block, if you will, in Del Tree. Coming up is the Trump White House preparing to end the immigration protections for Dreamers. The White House faced new questions on that today. More on that when the 11th hour continues. Remember that accident I got in with the pole and I had to make a claim and all that? They talk about Dreamers, right? Dreamers. They want the Dreamers. Everybody wants to be Dreamers. But the dreamers don't refer to our children. They refer to other children coming into our country. Saying, so we're going to have to stop them. We have to make a whole new set of standards. And when people come in, they have to come in. We're going to keep the families together. No, no, we're going to keep the families together. We have to keep the families together. But, you're going to but, they, have to but they have to come. We show great heart. DACA is a very, very difficult subject for me, I will tell you. We're going to deal with DACA with heart. The DACA situation is a very, very, it's a very difficult thing for me because, you know, I love these kids. I, I love kids. I have kids and grandkids. President Trump has always maintained a hard line on illegal immigration, but as you heard just there, he's sometimes taken a softer stance on the so-called dreamers, those who came to America as young children, who were raised in America. The president is deciding if he'll end an Obama-era program known as DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. That's a program temporarily protecting undocumented immigrants who were brought to the United States when they were very young. This was President Trump today when asked about the dreamers. 
Yeah, I mean, essentially uh, what Tillis is doing and what some other Republican uh, members of Congress are trying to do is, is essentially give Trump a bit of a life raft uh, for DACA. This, as we mentioned before, this has been very difficult for Trump. Um, he's torn between trying to serve his base, but also a larger electorate. Not only that, kind of his own moral feelings. Obviously, this is something that's hurt him, uh, impacted him personally. Uh, the, the, uh, the legislation that Tillis is offering is something that would make it a lot more palatable, um, essentially providing him some type of cover so that uh, Trump could say, you know, it's kind of a two-win. He gets the win for ending the program, serving as a base, but he also gets to tell uh, dreamers that he's been working on it like he did before, uh, and this is an opportunity to say that. Now, look, Congress, it's very hard to get anything passed in Congress. There's a lot of sympathy for uh, for these group of immigrants more than any other uh, group of undocumented immigrants. You saw that with Paul Ryan's uh, you know, talk earlier today on the radio, uh, but getting anything through this Congress has been difficult. Yeah, getting them to agree on what the actual letter is is difficult. Uh, Franco, stay with us, please. And Aaron, thank you so much for uh, staying with us and for being here. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. All right, coming up, one senator calls the president poorly informed and reminds his colleagues we answer to the American people. That senator, Republican John McCain. Much more on that when the 11th hour continues. Let's trust each other. Let's return to regular order. We've been spinning our wheels on too many important issues because we keep trying to find a way to win without help from across the aisle. What have we to lose by trying to work together to find those solutions? We're not getting done much apart. That was Senator John McCain in an impassioned plea to Congress the day he returned to Washington following brain surgery in July. He's renewing that call today ahead of the busy September session in a Washington Post op-ed. McCain wrote that it's time for members of Congress to respect each other and to respect that they need each other to get anything done. He writes, quote, that has never been truer than today when Congress must govern with a president who has no experience of public office, is often poorly informed, and can be impulsive in his speech and conduct. We must respect his authority and constitutional responsibilities. We must, where we can, cooperate with him. But we are not his subordinates. We don't answer to him. We answer to the American people. Back with us is Frank Ordonez, and we're joined by Jamil Smith, contributing writer for the Daily Beast. Uh, it's good to see you. I think maybe the strangest thing about this, Jamil, uh, I'm checking my phone to make sure I'm not right, is that the president, wrong. the president hasn't tweeted in response to something that was published by John McCain earlier this morning. That's not like him. But John McCain has, has proved to be uh, a steady and reliable thorn in the side of yet another president. He has been at Donald Trump's uh, side uh, as a thorn uh, since the beginning of this administration. Well, I mean, the column is nice, but it's late. Um, look, John McCain showed a lot of integrity by casting the vote to essentially kill the Obamacare replacement. That said, he's also the same guy who introduced Sarah Palin to America and helped sort of grease the wheels culturally for men like Trump to rise politically. Also, frankly, this column doesn't say anything that liberals haven't been saying for two years. We've known he's impulsive. We've known that he makes bad decisions. We know that he's poorly informed. So I'm not really sure why we need to congratulate John McCain for finally coming around. Uh, we really need to see him back this up with some action. Jimmy, you had to bring up the Sarah Palin thing. You're just not letting bygones be bygones. Franco, what is uh, John McCain hoping to accomplish with this? Because uh, it's not that he's just come out and decided uh, that he thinks that Congress isn't working. This is a must, as much an admonishment of Congress as it is of the president. It, it is. And I mean, I would, I would agree that liberals have been saying these things, but uh, John McCain is a Republican, and what he's trying to do is do is encourage his Republican colleagues to do what they have not done, and that is stand up to this president, stand up to the president's rhetoric, and encourage his own party uh, that they do not work uh, for this president. As he said, they're not their support now. They are in, uh, they're working together for the American people. Uh, and I, it's kind of like the old Maverick, of, the old Maverick John McCain. Uh, Jamil, 
Well, one of the things that's interesting is Jeff Flake, uh, the other senator from Arizona, also a Republican, has recently penned a, a book and an op-ed about conservatives going back to what they uh, believe to be their shared values and that this president has taken them off that track. And in this in this desire to fulfill the president's agenda, uh, they, they've gone down this unusual road and that they should be brought back. This hasn't been fully embraced by, by conservatives, including Republicans in the Senate. But is there, do you think there's likely to be more of that in this session than there has been the idea that Republicans and Senate have got to be their own body? Well, they're faced, they're faced now with the urgency of actual governance. They're now in a position, a lot of them have been elected to obstruct Obama. And so now they're in a position where they actually have to do the work of the government. They have to pass budgets. They have to pass, uh, make sure that the government stays, uh, you know, all, you know, pay its bills and whatnot. They have to make sure that the people who are suffering from Hurricane Harvey get relief. Now, let's see if they can actually do this. Let's see if they can actually back up a lot of these, all this sound and fury about uh, President Trump with some actual action. Let's see them stand up to him if he decides to get rid of DACA. Let's see them stand up to him against you know, these legislative priorities that are really nativist uh, you know, candy for his, uh, his rapid base rather than actual uh, priorities for the nation. We don't need a wall. We need actual maybe balls around Houston to make sure that the climate change doesn't swamp it. All right, you mentioned the shutdown. we got to talk about it, but let's fit in a break. And coming up, the shutdown threat is still looming. There's a lot on the docket when lawmakers get back next week. But after this war of words that happened between President Trump and Mitch McConnell, remember that? It seems like ancient history was just a couple weeks ago. Can Republicans do what Jamil is talking about? Can they get down to the business of governing? We're back after this. How's it going? Oh, I see you found your partner in crime there. I should have seen that coming. Yeah, y'all are a few peas on a pod right there, I'm sure. See what, what have I been missing here? I'm going to put this on the screen for all posterity.
soon as I figure out how the hell to use this. Okay. <laughs> oh, this is priceless. Oh wow. Okay, wait. I'm, I'm gonna let me go get my. I, I set my cigarette down, thinking I was gonna be over here quickly. Before I get started, though, I wanted to show y'all the uh, the rose-colored varieties and the rainbow monty. Hopefully. Oh wait, let me go get that little orange screen filter thing. See if that works. Oh, there you go. Cool. You can see it. Cool. You can actually see what color I see right now. Oh, and there's the rose bubble. Check it out. And there's the other one behind it. And there's another one in that rock down there. Organ pipe coral. And that right there is called a rainbow montifora. You can't quite see the different colors that it has, but it's it's cool. And that's the rosy parietes. That thing is badass. It plates and peaks. And that's a sand dollar monty, supposedly. I think I need to still do some research on what that one is. And I have what this what this one is on videotape. I need to like write it down so I can remember it. And that's and then chocolate chip money for. Oh, and now I dropped the thing. is here just in time to read this funny conversation that unfolded between Lacey and our new friend. You might imagine how that went if Lacey came in and saw the conversation that I was having with him. We're sitting there talking about the dodo on Alice in Wonderland, how he's a representation of the complacency demon. Uh -huh. um, I thought he was talking about an inbred condor. But, uh, 
I, I was going to have the pleasure, but I think you might throw that one. Okay. I suggest you click on the text and use the scroll wheel to make it. Hey, everybody. Back to right here. Well, you, you don't need all that context. Just I was why I tried to sum it up. We were talking about the tree. And <laughs> she's like, "What the fuck, really?" You want to read her and I'll read him? Uh, uh, I went too far down. <laughs> oh, here we go. Okay. No, this is where I was. <laughs> oh, we need to read it for, like, Joey, for Joey and stuff, man. <laughs> What? But it's on there, so they'll be able to read. <laughs> but what if what if he's in his car? What if, what if he needs to listen? What if he can't squint? Like that can't be visible on my phone. That'll work on my TV. <laughs> Alright, we'll go back up to where you want to start and I will pop spot down here. These work good on the phone though, don't they? Oh, and these don't work good anywhere. <laughs> it's foamy and delicious. So is your face. <laughs> So he's saying something about the king, he's the king of Iron or whatever. Lacey comes in, what the fuck? Really? With a bunch of big smiley faces. And new guy's name's Pete. Hi, Pete. Uh, <laughs> go back about half an hour. Really interesting. Lacey says, oh, I'm sure. He says, well, use the scroll wheel. Cool, like an ice cube. Now this conversation recounter. Like she said, and then he said, come on, come on. You are the expert. I thought you were supposed to be coming and doing this with me. Uh, no, aw, me. Poor Denise, I've been over here the whole time. Yeah. All right. So, cool like an ice cube. A melted one. Melted as fuck. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> Donald Trump equals... DT equals 420. Middle name John. Well, it's a fake name, but yeah. Um, John and 9 11 goes back a whole lot further than <coughs> him, and, and so does the idea of a Trump. Um, he adopted those names because he's a KGB Satanist. Anyway, um, I don't know what kind of face that is, but. Squishy fishies. Squishy fishies. Yeah, okay. The bigger one is the female. She's a nympho. The poor male is just shagged out. <laughs> there she goes again. She just fucked him that quick. <laughs> shagged out. You know, this is the only place I get my quote-unquote news now. And the squishy fishies are why. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't want to be seen as hard-hearted. Hey Sean, it's going. Woof, woof. I'm loving the hair, yo. Oh. Yeah, his hair is kind of magnificent today, isn't it? <laughs> is that better? And Pete is still here. And Lacey is not alone in the craziness. And don't drop the thing. What thing? What thing are you not supposed to drop? I don't know what that is. What, what thing was he not supposed to drop? There's lots of things I think he shouldn't drop. Camera? You're not supposed to drop the phone. No, oh, so I, I was using the little orange lens thingy and showing off our uh, our big varieties coming up. <laughs> hey, Lacey. Yeah, I was uh, making friends with the neighbor. <laughs> our neighbor's cool as fuck. And apparently... Which gave me time, like, with the time with the house to myself to give a very interesting lecture, which you might want to go back and listen to. Yeah. <coughs> but yes, the next door neighbor and I learned a lot about each other tonight. Oh. And she's cool people. And um, apparently, 
Carl Mann was in the military too. He was in the Air Force. So I showed them the picture of dad's retirement and he started telling me what all my dad was decorated with. My dad has a purple heart. Hmm. Don't say the two in front of me. I'm just a caveman. <laughs> no, I meant like, shut up. <laughs> so how are you I'm all tonight? I'm just tonight? contract that doesn't exist. Orange lens works really good on that lens. <laughs> Talk to my soul, swim in a fishbowl. Year after year. Apparently, we're on to song lyrics now. <laughs> and so I sang them instead of just reading them. Was that a request, Lacey? No, it wasn't Lacey, it was Pete. <laughs> Is that a request, Pete? <laughs> Somebody Lace, serenade you? Lacey said, I don't know, Sean dropped something and it confided me, but she, what she meant to say was confused, <laughs> which she fixed later on down the thing. So Lots how do you like our new clownfish? Isn't he pretty? He's so fabulous, we named him Yuma Chica. Has he danced for her yet? Or is she just raping him and running off? Well, that's what I gathered from the conversation, apparently. She's just raping him and running away. <laughs> I, I'd ask if she gave you a black eye, dude, but I think that's like just the color of your face. <laughs> I don't want to sing. Oh, do you? Sean plays guitar, too. Pete plays guitar. I played flute. Ask him if he saw the house in the <laughs> Rape and run. The poor guy has nowhere to swim to. No, he really doesn't. But that's the point. He can't run away, so he has to he has to help her lay the eggs. Well, she has to lay the eggs and he's supposed to fertilize them. <laughs> Hashtag rape. <laughs> Something tells me I came in the room and, and just made this take a terribly dark and twisted turn. <laughs> Hashtag be good to mama. When you're good to mama, mama's good to you. Yeah, maybe one watch Chicago or something. <laughs> Got a little mama, always sees her through. When you're good to mama, mama's good to you. You don't do the breakdown on the first try of twice in a row. <laughs> he has sore fish stick. <laughs> At least it isn't frozen. <laughs> oh, you thought that was funny too, huh, Totsky? <laughs> Let alone freezer burn, my God. What you doing, pretty girl? Maybe that's why Eric Trump came out like that. <laughs> when Donald Trump's dick was freezer burn. <laughs> they didn't thaw out quite right. <laughs> Our zinnias are absolutely gorgeous. They're just like... They couldn't swim on their own, so the Russians came in and pushed them over the line. Oh! <laughs> I see that, Lacey. <laughs> <laughs> I 
That's okay, I have problems every day. Dance, little fish boy, dance. Dance for the little fish lady, dance. <laughs> Okay. Hey, I like my shirt. Doesn't seem to be going all that well. But they'll be fine. He's just too handsome. How could, how could she resist? Really? Yeah, no time anyway. So does anybody have any questions about these guys, clownfish breeding in general, or the reef tank up here? Those are the babies from Bubbles and Zoom up there, seven of them. Those are my runs. On that back wall back there, those are called pulsating zines. We're about to call it a broadcast here, lazy. Um, I think their interaction was a little more entertaining early on. She kept on going right over to him over and over again. Kind of fun. And then you get to hear my lecture. It was... Wasn't nothing... I don't, I don't think many new topics were discussed, but some interesting angles. That is just one beautiful pair of clownfish right there. I don't know. Why would the symbol for Jesus be a fish? And on that bombshell, it's time to end. Thanks for watching, everybody.
please click the like button and subscribe if you haven't already check your subscription if you are a subscriber because you might have to uh, you know resubscribe no really Lacey okay, okay. Look, I'll tell you what we'll be on again in a little while not not for the fish maybe for the fish All right. but uh send us a message on uh, Facebook or uh, over Twitter um, follow us on Twitter at the lost begotten and uh, yeah. thanks for watching everybody have a good night um, see you possibly for 11 Z's if I don't pass out peace